So jumping forward, I'm going to mention some more titles. Uh, uh, Starstruck. Yes. Gillian Armstrong. Yep. Um, one of Australia's first, well, a, a musical. Yes. And a first effort at a big budget kind of musical. Sure. Uh, was it very different mixing that kind of a film? Well, it was, and it was interesting too because that was a stereo film and we weren't very, very far into the stereo era then. See, we didn't do any stereo films till around 19... Oh, I think Star Wars started the whole stereo craze because you then got that two-track optical thing. That yeah, was 81, was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did indeed. So Star Trek is 1982. We were a bit late picking it up. Okay, correct, it, yeah. correct. So this was early 80s. Um, that's the only film I've done that I wasn't chief mixer on um, because they wanted a very experienced stereo mixer and this mixer called, called David Dockendorf, who was the mixer that Ron used way back to do the demonstrator at the Glen Glen um, complex, who, who mixed the Paramount movies. Mm -hmm. He came out here especially and, and um, stayed here for, I think, we, I think it was about three weeks, it might have been a month it took to mix that. And so I, I learnt stereo, actually, essentially from him on that picture. Oh, so that was worthwhile. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and he was a good bloke, a really good guy. We got, we got very good friends. In fact, some years later, I think about 86 something, I mixed a picture, I was to mix a picture called um, The Earthling. Yes. <clears throat> and I went to Hollywood um, against better advice uh, to supervise the, the re-recording of the dialogue. And I had a, a really bad blue with the director. And he fired me, fortunately, off the picture, which was... Fortunately for yeah, you. Yeah, for me, it was very, <laughs> very good news for me. And they were then in, in, in a bind, and I'd gone on very well with the, with the line producer, a fellow called Elliot Schick. And he said, Peter, what am I gonna do? I need a mixer, you know? And I said, there's a very good mixer in Hollywood who's already been to Australia, and, and I'm sure he'd come again at reasonable money. And I was actually staying at his home. <laughs> so I drove home, because I drove his car that, that day down the freeway, and so I was very brave that day. I drove home and said, mate, I've had a blue of this guy, I'm not on the picture. He said, does it matter? I said, well, not greatly to me, no. I'm glad to be getting out of here, but he needs a mixer. Do you want to do it? He said, yeah, sure. So he came out and mixed that film. He actually stayed with me. Um, and he, he mixed the film called The Earthling. Hmm. But he was a, 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 a really good mate of mine. So on the, other, on the first picture, Starstruck, we got on, we got on great. He was, he was a good guy. He shared me around Hollywood and all the Hollywood gear. Well, it's good so to have a connection. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, Monkey Grip, Squizzy Taylor, Far East. Lonely Hearts, The Year of Living Dangerously. Good picture. Which was, again, this was a bit of a breakthrough film, actually. Um, Peter that, Weir. Yeah, again. and... And, uh, um, and it's the one that, apart from the Mad Max, has really brought Mel Gibson to the attention yes. of the Americans. Although I did mix Mel's first picture, called Tim. Tim, which yeah. I saw earlier. Which <coughs> yeah, Tim, um, and that was done for Michael Pate. Michael, yeah. Now, that's interesting. We talked earlier, before we, we roll the camera here, that about soundtracks and how they can be full of everything or just full of what matters. Michael Pate had been, an, oh, obviously was an actor, and had been in Hollywood for a long Homicide time. Homicide and that sort of show. Yes, yeah. well he was, he was an actor here, and they, they found, discovered him, and he went to Hollywood and he acted in a lot of movies. I remember him being a, a henchman in the Batman TV series, oh, among other things. Oh, was he? Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> he was also a Red Indian a few times because yeah. he had that, that, that jaw they liked, I think. Anyway, he directed Tim, and we mixed, we mixed the first two reels and he said, I'm really confused about a lot of things here. I said, mate, tell me. He said, I'm hearing things I'm not seeing. For instance, there's a dog barking. Yeah, there is. He said, why is it barking? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, if they ask my dubbing editor, friend, and I, I forget who did that. I think it was Bob Cogger, anyway. It was, a, it was quite a lovely, natural thing to put in this lonely scene. And he said, I don't want it. I said, fine, mate, no problem. And whilst he was a little bit extreme as to, if you don't see it, when I'll hear it, mm. which is, was probably going a bit far sometimes, he had that real minimalist view of things, you know? And so that was Tim. And it was a very simple soundtrack. It was very, I thought it was a very good soundtrack, actually. Um, but that was the first film that I'd ever seen Mel in. And of course, then he was in Gallipoli and 
and uh, the film you mentioned. Mad um, Max. Mad. So uh, speaking of that, what is your philosophy on sound mix? Um, how much do you put in? How much should you keep out? Should it only be what we see on screen? What's your approach? No, you know, I think you need more than that, you often. But there's no right and wrong. I mean, that's a taste thing, you know? I mean, what colour do you want to paint this room? I mean, who says what's right? So it's just, you just have a feeling for it. If it feels right, it's right. Film's not, not fact, you know? It's, it's, if it feels right, it is right. And, if it, if, and my view is, and this is why I got on very well with most of the directors, my view was, if you really want it, you should get it. I would say to you, would you think about this? But this is yours. When you take it away, I remember mixing a commercial for Ray Lawrence who made a Bliss. Bliss and the, the, Lantana. Yeah. yeah. The first commercial I ever, first time I ever met him, I mixed a commercial because he's made, oh, I think he's still making commercials anyway, before I mixed Bliss. And it was, a, it was the thing about mum deodorant. And it, it, the, the thing was, what can't you live without? And, he, and, and this, whoever it was would say, I can live without my dog, I can live without my car, I can't live without my mum, you know? I remember that. And they shot, they shot a, a, this commercial in Eric Porter's studio in um, uh, uh, just across the bridge. And it was echoey. And this little actress girl said, um, what, what can't you do without? Now, now, the guy said, what can't you do without? And she, you didn't see him. You just heard his voice. And she said, well, I can live without this and I can't live without my mum. So we went in to post-sync the line. We went in, that's right. We went in to post-sync the line. What can't you do without? And I said to Ray Lawrence, we sh I think we should put, how do you want this to sound? Close up, like she was very close up. Close up, how do you want it? He said, well, you're the sound man. He said, you should tell me. I said, you own the commercial, you should tell me. He said, what do you mean? I said, I can do it any way you like. I suggest this is the way to do it. When you move out of here, you've got it, and I haven't got it, it's yours. How do you want me to do it? Mm. And he was like. You're directing. Well, you know, <laughs> so, but he appreciated that, and I got on great with him, and I mixed Bliss for him. I thought Bliss was a very good picture, by the way. And that, that was a, well, that was of another of those. It was a breakthrough picture. It, it in was a way, because wasn't it? it was so different and original. Sure. And it was kind of a, um, getting away from the period dramas yes. in many ways that we yes. were doing and, and getting a bit more surreal. That opening scene when the camera came up and the body was, you know, mm. it was fantastic. But what, the only reason I tell you a little story about that is that I think it's, I always believe it's the mixer's job. You all, you've got a view. You see something, you think, oh, I like that or I don't. I mean, that's just. A gut feeling but I just think it's the mixer's job to say to the director I think this is worth trying and if you don't like it then that's fine he it's his movie and he's gonna have his argument with his producer and I don't mind who wins there. That's, <laughs> that's up, up to them, that's up to them. <laughs> but in actual fact when I find when I found producers and directors arguing rightly or wrongly I just naturally favored the director 